Hello and welcome to Tom Talks. Today we're going to be looking at computational power and how you can maximise what you've actually got. Now the world, the world is ever evolving and uh, our ability to get our hands on good computing power gets easier, easier and cheaper and cheaper. But something which isn't shared as much is how to maximise what you already have. And there are some basic things that we can actually do to really get the most out of our setup. Now, I've done some quick studies before in the past and um, I've got these numerics up so we can go through them. So I think this is going to be quite a cool little video. Okay, so firstly, we'll quickly cover what actually makes a good CFD computer. And uh, to start, I don't know much about computers at all, but I've got a few friends that do and um, the internet does as well. So anyway, we'll just go across some of the very basic um, components and how they their relationships with the CFD runtime, which is the most important thing. So starting off, uh, CPU. Now typically your CPU is going to be the most important factor and you usually spec your PC around your CPU for CFD. Now there's a very important relationship uh, with cores versus CFD runtime, which we'll go through a bit later, but um, yes, as you increase cores, you are going to decrease your runtime. The same thing with clock speed, except it's a different relationship. And the reason we have to be careful is because clock speed isn't perfect across different architectures. So you need to keep that in mind because the actual number of operations per second might um, actually be different across um, different architectures. Hyperthreading. In CFD, typically we turn off hyperthreading, and the reason we turn it off is because our operations usually take a bit longer than normal operations, and so we just create a bottleneck, so it's typically not needed. Now, RAM. Uh, firstly, we've got RAM speed, and RAM speed generally will, it will increase uh, or decrease your CFD runtime. By how much and what relation, I have no idea. I've not seen any studies on it. I'm sure that there are, but um, I've not seen any studies on it, and I don't have enough money to go get another 128 gigs of RAM at a, at a lower speed for a cool test. Um, so generally, um, the, the, the bigger factor that which we mainly consider is our mesh count or our simulation size with RAM. Now, RAM will determine how big the cases are that you can actually run. And so if there's a very general rule where for um, every two gigabytes of RAM, you can run a one million cell um, mesh. This is incredibly, incredibly general because there are so many different types of meshes out there and each one has a different RAM usage and um, different element counts. So that is a very, very broad statement that a lot of people throw out there, but I mean, as a very rough ballpark, I suppose that you could, you could probably use it. Now, GPU. So you can use GPU acceleration, which is more of a thing in very, very um, high-end, uh, CFD places where they've got a lot of money to spend on a lot of hardware. Typically a lot of people don't use GPU acceleration. Um, I've never used GPU acceleration, but it is a thing and some softwares, commercial softwares, do have GPU acceleration, but typically only for very, very, very expensive GPUs. Um, stuff that's usually well above $10,000. So Mainly our GPU, uh, in most of our cases, uh, we're just using for our visualization of results. This just means that it's, it, with a better GPU, it's going to be a little bit smoother um, when we're dealing with quite big cases to, to view our results. And um, lastly, it's always obviously very important to remember what software we're dealing with. So. Obviously, we've got a lot of commercial softwares and we've also got lots of open source softwares. 
and the first thing to note is with commercial software you're going to have you're typically going to have some sort of limit on how many cores you can use um, so there's no point thinking that you're going to be running a specific simulation case with 64 cores if your license only allows you to use um, 16 so make sure that you're compatible between your software and hardware which is obviously really really important and straightforward but um, it's very easy to get wrong to be honest now you should also take care because some softwares are single threaded for certain processes so some softwares might have a mesher which is single threaded or a post processing tool which is single threaded this means that cores is obviously less important how many cores you have and clock speed is more of an important factor so we need to keep this in mind the next thing is parallel solving uh, in a commercial software we typically just punch in we've got 32 cores or whatever 32 go um, solve but the way that we're actually solving a case in parallel is we partition out our mesh into however many cores we're using and then uh, solve them with, with those cores and then stitch it back up together at the end. Now, a lot of commercial codes don't have the ability to really, really customize your partitions. So solving in parallel can be much less efficient than you would actually like it to be. For example, let's say that we've got quite a, um, quite a big external flow case, so something around a, like a jumbo jet or whatever. We're gonna have a very coarse um, section of our domain quite far away from the body and very fine around the body. If you just have a default, let's say let's break this up into um, four sort of sections it or maybe eight sections it's very likely that you're going to have a lot of sections of very coarse mesh um, not many elements in them at all very easy to solve and then you're going to have sections or maybe a section with basically the entire plane in it and this is going to be very inefficient as you can imagine so the open source softwares typically allow you to customize your partitions are a bit better um, so you can partition it out a bit more efficiently and have a more equal mesh count throughout so this is very important to remember let's say that we've already got a computer often something that's done poorly I think is maximizing what you've already got and generally what you're trying to do is balance your human resource with your computational resource um, Typically, you can fiddle with your computational resource more than you can with your human resource. Um, obviously very dependent, but that's typically the way it goes. So if you're in excess of um, a computational resource, you can usually run more accurate simulations. But there's some very important trends uh, that you should look at to understand for more specific applications what you should be doing. So a while ago for a project that I was on, um, I was using two, two PCs to, to do a lot of design iterations. And so I'll show you some of, some of the results with that. Now, PC1 is, um, had two Xeon Silvers, 16 core machine. So that's at a base of 1.8 gigahertz. It had 64 gigabytes of RAM um, at 2400 megahertz. It had a P400. Um, PC2, it was a 3970X Threadripper, 32 cores at a base of 3.7 gigahertz and 128 gigs of RAM at 3600 um, megahertz. And it had a P4000 graphics card. Now, yes, obviously PC2 is going to be faster than PC1, but that's not really the point. Uh, the point is maximizing what you've got and, and the trends. And so the results were as expected. Uh, PC2 in a single threaded performance was twice as fast as PC1 and when using maximum cores it was three times faster than PC1. Uh, so PC2 was faster than PC1 which is what you'd expect. Now it's important to note the clock speed um, when you do these simulations because it's 
going to be different to what the base clock speed was and will give you a better indication of um, some of the relationships. Now I have 3.5 to 50 million cells here um, because I did a few simulations sweeping through um, a bunch of different uh, mesh densities so you can see how the results change and basically it shows that the, the deltas between PC2 and PC1 are similar throughout. What's really a lot more important is plotting cores versus runtime because instead of just maxing out how many cores we can use, um, what you can do is sweep through a bunch of cores and get a, a graph and it'll look something like this. So I've split PC1 on the left and I've put PC2 on the right. Now PC1 only had 16 cores, PC2 had 32 cores. I've split these apart so so you can sort of analyze them separately if you'd like. The general rule is, as we increase our cores, our solving time, yes, it does decrease, but it decreases smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, you can see it here. So what I've, what I've done is I've actually um, got a trend line for my, my last graph, so I've only done a few simulations in my last graph, but grab a trend line and it allows you to effectively fill in some blanks um, and gain a solve time for a lot more cores and then you've got a better lookup table or a bigger lookup table, which is, you know, roughly ballpark. Now you can plot efficiency versus cores. This is if you take your base case core hours, so in this case two cores, and you divide it by the other case. So if you're looking at the six core case, you'd look at the core hours um, for six cores and you'll get that ratio, which is um, your computational efficiency. Now here you can already see that after about 12 cores um, with this particular set of data, uh, we're already only at about 50% efficiency of our two core case, which is quite staggering. So you can see how important it really is to maximize uh, your computational efficiency to have one of these lookup tables. Now, to make it even more obvious, you can calculate the derivative of your efficiency um, or the rate of change. In this case, I've just made it negative, so everything's positive. And you can really see how quickly you drop off your efficiency really very early on. You, you lose a lot of efficiency very early on and then later you're still losing efficiency but um, at, a, at a much smaller rate. Now, it's fairly obvious. If you've got a certain number of sims to get done and, and you want to minimize the time um, and then you check your results all at the end, uh, then all you do is run with basically your minimum number of cores so you can maximize your computational efficiency. And the opposite is true if you were trying to maximize how many simulations you could get done in a given time. So perhaps a design project where you're doing um, a lot of iterations, uh, you'd use the maximum number of cores provided that uh, you're in human excess and you can't start preparing the next case until the last case is been solved. This means that you basically want your cases just to be solved really as quickly as possible. But this is very rarely the case. There's a lot of times when we can actually be preparing a case whilst a case is already running. So I put together a really quick example which is much more realistic and this time we're trying to minimize our time to run 1000 simulations and each simulation takes 600 human seconds to prepare. Now, there's probably some form of automation here, but um, as with everything, we can usually get it somewhat close, um, but there's always things that the human needs to do. So this is quite a realistic example, I feel. Uh, it could be any sort of design project and you're sweeping through some sort of parameter where you still need to input some things and prepare some case setups. And for something like this, uh, 
if you're doing a lot of simulations, it can be very, very useful to define your problem and then use your lookup table to work out what the most efficient method actually is because it's not as obvious as you might think. So we'll consider all the cases. We said it takes 600 human seconds to prepare one case. That means that we can prepare 0.0017 cases every second. Now what you can do is use your lookup table to find how long a case for two cores takes, four cores, eight cores, 10 cores, whatever, up to 32 in this case. And then you can see how many um, cases you could prepare in that time. So I've got that there and then I've rounded them down because we can't actually run 5.2 cases or 5.8 cases or whatever. So you need to round those down to the nearest whole number and then from here it's very very easy to, to calculate how many um, different sets of cases we need to run. We know how long they take from our lookup table again and we can then work out um, what the most eff efficient way forward is. And you can see here, our case with 10 cores is the most efficient, which is, you know, we couldn't just guess that. Um, we, we really need our lookup table. So I think that that's quite neat. Now you can see here as well, the 18 core case is actually blacked out. And the reason I've done this is because you need to check for an overhaul. So, in this case, we've got 18 cores, and during this time, we can prepare two cases. Now, we've only got a 32 core machine, which means we're actually only going to be able to run with one um, case in there uh, because we, we're in we're, we're down four cores on what we'd actually need if we were to run two cases um, with 18 cores each. So, you need to check for the overhaul. But um, it's a neat way to gain a basic overview into how to maximize your computational efficiency when you're doing a lot of simulations. And so the lookup table as well is a very neat way to maximize the hardware that you've already got. So that concludes it for this video. Now, in terms of CFD and personally the stuff that I enjoy and don't enjoy, this is much more on the lower side, so it's definitely not ex exciting to talk about, but I do think it's still quite important to do, and uh, I think it's very important with your own hardware to do your own studies so you can really un understand where you sit on your curve with um, how long your cases take to set up, because you can find some surprising gains there. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you in the next video.